Hi, everyone. You're very welcome to our live stream. My name is Brendan. I work for the education team here in the National Museum of Ireland Country Life. This year, we were delighted to welcome back some fairies to the grounds after a few years of being absent. Um, they've set up home in some of the really beautiful trees that we have here all over the grounds of Turtle Park House. They kindly allowed us to set up a trail between their homes so as we could tell people all about the trees um, that the not oh, <laughs> sorry, all about the trees that we have here on the grounds. You're gonna have to forgive me, this is my first time. Um, today I'm joined by Fiona Dowling, artist and storyteller, and what she's going to do, she's going to talk a little bit about some of the trees that we've selected. Uh, give us some information and tell us some stories about them. So I'm going to hand over to Fiona, who's out and about on the grounds. I am now standing beside a hawthorn. Because it's winter, the hawthorn has nearly shed all its leaves, but there are still a couple hanging on. And I've picked up <laughs> some leaves for you from the ground so that you know what they look like. Now, the hawthorn has many names and all those names tell us something about it. Let's start with hawthorn. The hawthorn is thorny. Ow! I, just, I broke a thorn. <laughs> so yeah, the hawthorn is a thorny tree. Um, and ho, well, hoes is the name of its fruit. Around August, September, October, you might see those little red fruits coming onto the hawthorn. Uh, it's also called uh, the white thorn and the maybush. And that is because around the month of May, beautiful white blossoms appear all over the hawthorn. And the hawthorn can grow up to about 15 meters, which is high enough. It's longer than a bus. Uh, but most often, you'll find them much shorter because they are used a lot for hedges. There's a lot of uh, hawthorn growing all over Ireland and the birds love hitting the hoe berries. As for humans, well, the hoe is actually edible, but it doesn't taste bad and it doesn't taste that good either. They say that in the past, hoes were eaten only when there was no other food available. There is even a saying, and that is the poor man's bread and cheese. And you know what that saying refers to? Well, if in early spring you grab, you pick two really young hawthorn leaves and you pick also a hawthorn blossom and you put the blossom between the two leaves, there you have the poor man's bread and cheese. Now, picking a few young leaves, a few blossoms, that's probably as far as it's safe to go with the hawthorn. You don't want to risk cutting a branch or the whole tree because you might be in danger of angering the fairies. The hawthorn is also called a fairy tree and there are loads of beliefs and superstitions to do with the fairies. Now, not every hawthorn is a fairy tree. The hawthorns most likely to be fairy trees are the lone hawthorns, the ones that you might find on their own in the middle of a field, or ones that are part of a fairy ring, a fairy circle. So a circle of hawthorns. You don't want to get too close to them and you don't want to cut any branch from them. There are countless stories of people who have cut branches from those trees or cut the tree itself and they have fell into ill health, ill fortune, their house burned down, their cattle got sick. And the same stories say that if, for instance, they brought back that branch to the tree, well, their cattle got better, their health got better, and their fortune got better too. And thanks to all those stories, we have a lot of hawthorn here in Ireland. And that is great news for all the birds that like to nest in it like the robin, the thrush, the wren, or the blackbird. And the hawthorn is also a protective habitat for about 300 species of insects. There is one last thing about the hawthorn. There is a lovely tradition around the first, on the 1st of May, the tradition of the maybush, and it's still enacted in some parts of Ireland, even to this day. The tradition goes like this. On the 1st of May, you pick a hawthorn near your house and you decorate it 
with ribbons, with eggshells, with flowers. And this mere fact of decorating the hawthorn will bring you luck for the following growing season, the following harvest. The following story was told to me by Liz Weir, a fantastic storyteller from County Antrim. Once upon a time, on Rathlin Island in County Antrim, lived a little boy called Tommy. One day, Tommy announced to his mother that he was going to go out to pick blackberries. His mother knew exactly what he had in mind and she said, Oh, when you come back with the blackberries, maybe we can bake a cake together. Tommy, you see, had a very sweet tooth. He clapped his hands and he said, Oh, mom, that would be great. And he could already taste the sweetness of the blackberry pie. Now, Tommy, before you go, you need to change. Tommy was wearing his good clothes, which wouldn't do with the thorn and juice from the blackberries. So his mother brought him an old jumper full of holes and a pair of trousers that was raggedy, torn and stained. But that would just be perfect for berry picking. So Tommy changed. And just before he was out the door with his basket, his mother said to him, now you have to promise me two things, Tommy. One, that you will get home before dark. And the second one, that you will not go by the fairy tree. Tommy promised and he gave his mother a hug and was off. Now it was quite late in October and it was the end of the blackberry season. So whenever Tommy got to a blackberry bush, half of the blackberries were either too dry or moldy or so soft that they would crumble under your fingers. But there were still some that were good and he picked these ones. But it took an awful long time even to fill the bottom of his basket. And to find good blackberries, he had to go further and further and further away from his home. So far that he got to the valley in which grew the lone hawthorn, that fairy tree his mother had warned him about. And it so happened that on the other side of the fairy tree, there were perfect blackberry bushes. Now the blackberries on them were so big and they were glistening in the sun. Tommy thought, well, what if I don't stop near the fairy tree, but I just pass by it really quickly? And that's exactly what he did. He ran past the fairy tree without stopping. And then when he got to the blackberry bushes, he continued his harvest. And those blackberries were indeed delicious, perfect, ripe, sweet and he had his basket filled in no time. Now there was the way back to think about. He would do exactly the same thing, just run past the tree. And off he went. And as he passed the lone hawthorn, he tripped on a stone and fell flat on his face. He just had to take a few seconds to recover from the shock. And when he finally got himself up, he was not by the fairy tree any longer, no. He was in a sort of underground cave. And around him were a hundred pairs of little eyes watching him. The fairies had got him. And they were looking at him with a lot of interest. Some were rubbing their chins, others were folding their arms, others were rubbing their hands. What are they going to do with me? thought Tommy. And then one group of fairies took a big cauldron and started warming water in the cauldron with a fire. And the other fairies just climbed all over Tommy on his body and started to undress him. They were taking off his jumper, taking off the buttons of his shirt, putting out his trousers, his socks, everything. Tommy thought, they are going to eat me. And then he saw the same fairies coming back towards him with buckets, brushes, mops, sponges. And they climbed again all over his body and started washing him from head to toe. They were scrubbing his hair. They were scrubbing his back. They were mopping between his toes. They were sponging his legs. They were emptying their little buckets of water all over him. And then 
covering him in suds, rubbing, scrubbing. Now, Tommy wasn't one that was very fond of washing. And he thought, well, surely I'm too smelly for them to want to eat me like this, and that's why they're washing me. And he also saw that in the cauldron, where the fairies had heated up the water, now were his clothes being washed. And as time passed, and as the fairies were now rubbing smelly oils in his hair, Tommy started to feel a little relaxed and a little sleepy, and he fell asleep. When he woke up again, he saw that all the fairies were busy mending his clothes. Some were darning his socks, other ones were fixing the holes in his jumper, and other ones were redoing the hem of his trousers. They were doing a very good job. And Tommy got a little bit more hopeful. Well, if they're fixing my clothes, it's not to wear them for themselves. They're too big. So probably they're going to spare me. And with that, he fell asleep again. When Tommy woke up, this time he was back by the hawthorn tree. But he was different. He smelled nice. His hair was softer than it ever was. And his clothes were so well mended that they looked brand new. And he saw his basket of blackberries that were still there. And only a few had come off. So he picked up his basket, and a little stunned from his whole adventure, he walked home. Now his mother hadn't had a wink of sleep that night. She had been out with the neighbors, crying his name, shouting his name. And when they had found nothing, well, she had gone back home and just cried. Her face was so puffy, and there were still rivers of tears on her face. But when she heard the familiar footsteps, well, she got up, she ran towards Tommy, and she gave him a big, big hug. And then she pulled away. Tommy, is it you? You look so different. And Tommy said, yes, mom, it's me. And he told his story. And then he said he was really tired and needed to go to bed. So his mother made him a cup of hot chocolate, brought him to bed and sang him a lullaby, and he fell asleep. Tommy's mother was puzzled. She had heard many stories in which the fairies would kidnap a boy or a girl and would try to scrub away from them any trace of their previous existence, any trace from this mortal world, from the world above. And if they managed to do that, within 24 hours, that child would be theirs forever. So why did they bring Tommy back? They had obviously scrubbed him speak and span. She could not find any answer to that. And just at that moment, she heard a cry come from Tommy's room. She rushed to it, and she saw her little boy sat in bed holding his finger. Mommy, mommy, it hurts. His finger was quite red. His mother had a look, and she saw that deep under Tommy's nail, there was a little thorn from a blackberry bush that the fairies had missed. And thanks to that thorn, Tommy had been able to come back. Oh dear, the fairies have given me a new change of clothes. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to be here talking to all of you in so many different parts of Ireland. I know there are some of you in County Laos, some in County Kildare, some in Carrick on Shannon, and some in Oranmore. Well, welcome to you all. For the next tree, well, it's raining outside, so I'm not going to bring you out, but I'm going to introduce you the tree right here. My next tree is the hazel tree. Here it is. The hazel tree, you can recognize, well, by its leaves, which are kind of round and very, very soft. You recognize the hazel tree mostly thanks to its nuts, the hazelnuts. I'm sure you have tasted hazelnuts. They are so tasty. You might have found them maybe in your muesli, 
in your granola bars, or even in your chocolate spread. You know, the hazel tree was here in Ireland even before the first people were here. And that was lucky for those first people because it gave them something to eat. See, when the first people came to Ireland, there were no supermarkets, farming hadn't even been invented, so the only way for them to eat was to look around and see what they could catch, what they could hunt, what they could fish, what they could pick, berries and nuts. So the hazel was so important for the first people of Ireland. They could eat the nuts from it, and they could also make their shelters from the branches of the hazel tree. Now, the hazel tree is also used for making baskets, for making furniture, or even for making the structure of boats like the Corax. We have some here in the museum. There's other interesting uses. For instance, magic. I'm sure you've all heard of a magic wand. Well, in the old days, most of the magic wands were made out of hazel. So if a magician had a hazel wand with him, he could strike you and you might become a pig, a horse, a deer in a moment. Imagine that. Hazel rods were also very useful for finding water, for dowsing. And uh, one more thing I need to tell you about the hazel tree is a legend. In ancient Ireland, they said that under the source of every river in Ireland, there was a magic pool surrounded by nine hazel trees. And on those trees, they were the hazelnuts of knowledge. They said that all the knowledge of the world, all the answers to all the questions that you might have were in those nuts. And the legend also said that every now and again, the nuts fell into the water of the pool. And when they did, they created a beautiful purple wave, which attracted plenty of salmon. And the salmon then went eating the nuts. And every time the salmon would eat a nut, it would get a red spot on its skin. Imagine if that was the same with us when we eat sweets at Halloween. How many sweets did you eat there? Oh, just the one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But thankfully, it's not the case. The legend also said that when the salmon ate those nuts, the salmon had within him all the knowledge of the world. And if a man, a woman or a child went to eat that salmon, they would become the wisest person on the planet. Something to look forward to maybe one day. Well, this is leading us into our next story. I am sure some of you have heard about the famous Irish hero, Fionn McCurry. When Fionn was a very little boy, his head was full of questions. He would ask, why is the sun called sun and the moon called moon? I often look at the stars. Do the stars ever look at me? Why is the water wet? Why is the fire hot? Why don't I grow leaves like all of the other trees? At first, his teachers found those questions endearing. But after a while, they got a little fed up and they said, Fionn, you know, not all questions have answers. And for the questions that you don't have answers to, the best way to deal with them is write a poem about them. And Fionn said, how do you write a poem? And his teacher said, Fionn, we have taught you running, jumping, swimming. We have taught you fishing, hunting, fighting. But for poetry, you will have to go and find a new teacher. And they told Fionn about an old man called Finnegus, probably the best poet in Ireland. Now, Finnegus was a very old man, but he had also been a little boy. And as a little boy, just like Fionn, his head had been full of questions. And that's why he had become a poet, to try and answer them. But Finnegus had also another plan to find the answer to his questions. He had heard about the legend 
of the salmon of knowledge. Do you remember? The salmon that had eaten the nuts from the tree of knowledge. And he knew that if one day he was to catch that salmon, he would become the wisest man in Ireland. And all his questions would be answered. So for the last seven days, for, sorry, for the last seven years, every afternoon, Finnegas had been fishing to try and catch the salmon. So far, no luck. And then one day, there was a knock at the door. It was Fionn McCool, who had traveled five days to go and meet Finnegas. And he said, I've heard you teach poetry. Would you teach me? Phineas looked at this young boy and said, I like your determination. I would teach you with pleasure. Yes, I can do that. But how would it be if in exchange you cooked and cleaned for me? That was absolutely fine with Fionn. So every morning after that, Phineas would recite poetry and Fionn would listen and learn. And then every afternoon, while Phineas was fishing, Fionn would clean and cook for him. And then one day, a magical thing, a beautiful thing, an impossible thing happened. Phineas caught something and he tugged and he let go and he tugged and he let go and he tugged and oh, Fionn, I've got it, come quick. Fionn came with the net and they caught the fish. Now Phineas was so tired from all his efforts, he said, Fionn, please, will you cook the fish for me? But don't eat it. That was fine for Fionn. He wasn't hungry. And he hadn't heard about the legend of the salmon of knowledge, so he didn't care. But Fionn cared about doing a good job, so he made a fire, he put the salmon on a spit, and he turned the spit very slowly to make sure that the fish would be perfectly cooked on all sides. And then Fionn saw a big blister forming on the skin of the salmon. And quickly, with his thumb, he tried to burst the blister. But instead, oh, he burned himself. At that moment, Finnegas arrived and he said, Fionn, have you been tasting the salmon? And Fionn said, no, 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 no. I was cooking it and then there was this big blister. Well, I tried to burst the blister, but I burned myself. It's so sore. Finnegas then looked right into the eyes of Fionn. And what he saw there wasn't the look of a young boy. No, it was the depth and wisdom of someone with a big experience, someone very old. He saw into Fionn's eyes the stars and the entire universe. And Finnegas said, you know, Fionn, this salmon wasn't any ordinary salmon. It was the salmon of knowledge. And the legend says that whoever eats it will become the wisest man in Ireland. Well, that is you, my friend. Now the salmon is just an ordinary salmon. We might as well share it together. So Fionn and Finnegas shared the salmon. From that day, whenever Fionn had a worry, a problem, a question, all he needed to do was stick his thumb in his mouth and the answer would be given. We're going to go outside and I will introduce you to our next tree. Please meet my friend, the oak. Oaks can grow up to 40 meters in height and they can reach 
the ripe age of a thousand years old. Imagine that. The oak is really easy to recognize because of the shape of its leaf that has all those little round lobes on it. And it's easy to recognize fruit, the acorn. Squirrels love them. Now the oak is one of the native Irish trees. That means that the oak was here on this island before there were even people. The oak is sometimes called the king of the forest. Why is that? Because of the size it can attain, but also because of the properties of its wood. Its wood is incredibly strong and incredibly resistant to water or to insects. And it has been used widely for building, even building cathedrals. Um, you can find oak beams, oak doors in old buildings. It was also used for building boats. And it was used plentifully, abundantly. So much so that the oak population diminished as the boats were being built. And now there is still a trace of the presence of the oak in Ireland. And that trace is in all the place names that contain the Irish word for oak, Dora. You've got Kildare, you've got Derry, and so many other place names that suggest to us that in the past, the oak was abundant and ever present on the island. But don't worry about its future because, because of the squirrels. One of the ways that oak trees propagate is through squirrel. Because the squirrels, you see, they love the oaks. And when it's the end of the summer, beginning of the autumn, they start to gather acorns, hide them in special places in the ground. But you know what? They forget 70% of their hiding places. And thanks to their forgetfulness, those acorns that the squirrels have buried can grow into the future oak forest. What else about the oak? In the old days, in the time of the Brehan Laws, the oak tree was considered one of the noble trees of Ireland. And because of that, if you were caught chopping an oak tree or even a branch of an oak tree that didn't belong to you, you had to pay a fine. And for just chopping one branch of an oak tree, you had to pay the price of a one-year-old heifer. One last fact about the oak trees. It's the king of the woods. And for that reason, if you ever met a king and called him an oak, that would be a very good compliment for a king. So remember that you never know who you might meet. Once upon a time, in ancient Ireland, there was a king called the Dagda. The Dagda was a powerful king, and he had many wonderful possessions. But his favorite among all was his harp. The Dagda's harp was made of oak. Therefore, it was a really strong and solid harp. Not only that, it was decorated with gold, silver, and precious stones. The Dagda's harp could play the three noble tunes, the tune of sorrow that made people sad, the tunes, the tune of laughter that made them happy, and the tune of slumber that put them into a deep sleep. Not only that, with his harp, the Dagda could change the weather. A very handy skill to have. And he could also make sure that the four seasons came in the right order. Winter after autumn, spring after winter, summer after spring, and autumn after summer, and so on. Now the Dagda would have loved to be able to spend all of his days playing his harp. But he had other responsibilities. The Dagda needed to protect Arlen against its worst enemies, the Fomorians. 
the Fomorians were people who lived in all the little tiny islands around the island of Ireland. And they were always at war for one reason or another with the Dagda and his people, the Tuadidanon. On this particular day, there was a big battle between the Dagda and the Tuadidanon and the Fomorians. And while the battle was taking place, while the two armies were fighting, one of the Fomorians called four friends to him and said, Hey, psst, come, come here. I've got an idea. What about we go into the Dagda's house and we steal his harp? <laughs> well, his friends thought it was a good idea. So all of them went into the Dagda's house while the battle was taking place. And they went into his bedroom and they saw on the wall his harp. So they took it off, took it under their arms and ran away. They ran away to the Formorian camp. And there they were so proud of themselves and so happy that they were high five right, left and center. And they decided to organize a big feast, a big celebration for all the Formorians to celebrate the taking of the harp. Meanwhile, the battle was still taking place. The Dagda and the Tuadedanon and the Formorians on the other side. And eventually, one of them lost the Formorians. Oh, they were so sad after the battle, walking back to their camp. But what surprise they got when they realized that a small group of them had managed to steal the Dagda's harp. So they started rejoicing and celebrating. The two at the were also celebrating because they had won the battle. And one after the other, the man said, Dagda, play us a merry tune on your harp just to celebrate our victory. And the Dagda said, well, of course I will. And he went home to get his harp, but he couldn't find it. It wasn't on his bedroom wall. It wasn't in the banquet hall. It wasn't in the kitchen. It wasn't in the attic. It wasn't in the cellar. Uh, has anybody seen my harp? No, 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 no. Well, the Dagda knew at once that his harp had been stolen by the Fomorians. Ooh, he became red in the face and his whole body started to tremble with fury. And at once he went out to get his harp back. He heard the Formorians before he could see them. Oh, they were laughing, drinking and eating in their banqueting hall, celebrating the taking of the harp. And just at that moment, the Formorians were getting all their musicians to try playing on the harp. But they didn't know that the harp wouldn't make any music unless it was the Dagda himself playing it. So one after the others, the four more young musicians tried. And tried. And tried. No luck. But they were having fun. And they were having so much fun laughing at the harp and in silence, they didn't notice that Dagda had stuck his head through the door. Now Dagda had spotted his harp and he called to his harp with the magical formula he always used. He said, come summer, come winter, from harps and bags and pipes. Now you can say it with me. Come summer, come winter, from harps and bags and pipes. Once more. Come summer, come winter, from bags and harps and pipes. And when the harp heard the voice of her master, he started to tremble and eventually lifted off in the air, crossed the whole banqueting hall, knocking nine Formorians on the head, and eventually landed softly in the Dagda's hands. Now the Formorians were all standing up with their weapons to try and get the harp back. But the Dagda was standing very relaxed, very confident. He flexed his fingers and started to play the tune of sorrow. Blum, 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 blum. The 
tears were welling up in the Formorian's eyes, and soon they were streaming down their faces. Plum, 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 plum. All those Formorians were crying. They were crying about a toy that broke when they were four, about a dog that died when they were five, about the night when their mother forgot to kiss them goodnight. Plum, plum, plum. Well, the Formorian's eyes were so full of tears that they could no longer see the Dagda. And the Dagda was pleased. He released his hands for a moment and gave them a little shake and then started playing the tune of laughter. Oh, the four Morians quickly wiped their tears and they started to smile and they started to hug each other. They were so glad. They were laughing because it's so good to laugh after you've had a big cry. They were laughing because they were alive. They were laughing because they were together. Some were dancing on the table, some were dancing around the tables. And the Dagda was pleased. Once more, he released his fingers, gave them a little stretch and started to play the tune of slumber. Bloom. The Formorians felt heavily on their chairs and they laid their heads on their arms, on each other's shoulders, and closed their eyes. And they all fell in a deep, deep sleep and started to snore. And the Dagda was pleased. And continuing playing the tune of slumber, the Dagda started to walk back. And he walked back until he got to the safety of his house. From that day, the Dagda never let himself be separated from his precious heart. He asked his best leather workers to make him a really strong strap so that he could have his heart on his back at all times. And they say that a while later, when the Dagda and all the two Adedanans had to hide from the surface of the earth and go underground in the fairy mounds, in the sheaths, when they became the good people, the fairy folks of Ireland, well, their magic harp was still with them. And this is why, to this day, the seasons are still in the right order. Winter after autumn, spring after winter, summer after spring, and autumn after summer. But someday, if you see that the weather is not quite in keeping with the season, a hot day in January or a cold day in August, well, you can think of the Dagda somewhere under a fairy mound, playing his harp. Thank you so much for being with us today and listening to our stories. We hope that one day you'll be able to come and see those trees in real life for yourself. Thanks, Fiona. That was really good. Hope you enjoyed the stories and that you've all woken up after the, the sleeping tune. Um, just to say thanks to everyone for joining us for the stream. Um, don't forget to check our website, uh, museum.ae, where you can find out more information about events that are coming up. Um, thanks very much. We'll talk to you soon.